So here we are at the BAFT Europe 2023 Forum. Delighted to be joined by yourself, Oswald, from Minetta Go. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Such a pleasure. So can you give a quick introduction? Who are you, where are you from, and, and what do you do? Um, so my name is Oswald Kaler. I used to be the managing director of the Digital Standards Initiative. Before that, I worked in the mining industry, trying to digitize really complex supply chains are uh, specifically focused on trade. Um, I used to work at BHP, head of data strategy globally, um, and now I'm focused on uh, solving fraud in trade finance. Thank you very much. And, and I know our previous conversations used to all be around removing the paper and I think let's continue that conversation two, two years on. Let's talk about the UK Electronic Trade Document Bill because it's been in, in the front of mind and, and the topic of conversation today at BAFT. Can you, can you give us a bit of an overview of, of what's changed, what's coming up and, and what's happening in, in UK Parliament right now? Well, it's quite interesting, actually. When we think about digitizing trade and trade finance processes, one of the core challenges we've had over the last 20 years is how do we actually do it at scale? So we've been locked in this um, 1% to 2% trade digitization um, you know, effectiveness rate globally, um, and we haven't been able to move past that. And one of the core reasons isn't just the standards, but it's actually how do you digitize specific documents as a part of that process. Um, you know, uh, the Bill of Lading, for example, being one of those. And so this is something that the private sector can't solve themselves. We can do a lot of things, we can innovate, change the way people work, but making sure that a title document is actually legally recognized in a court of law is massively important towards achieving you know, higher volumes and higher scales in that use case. And so the work that the UK government is doing is going to be a major paradigm shift and the amount of volume that we can actually digitize. English and uh, Welsh law is uh, fundamentally using between, I heard two numbers, 60 and 80% of global trade documents globally. So this will really be a game changer. Um, and in addition to that, I think the last thing I'll, I'll add to it is, you know, Chris Southworth from the ICC UK and Sarah Green uh, from the actual Law Commission have done a remarkable job, not just engaging the business community and the banking community and the carrier community, but truly understanding what those blockers are and have fundamentally delivered a great bill that's actually going to enable us to scale. So exciting. So. Let's fast forward uh, a hypothetical two or three months when, when all of this actually gets enacted into, into common law. What does that actually mean? Are we going to see digital documents being used by corporates and banks overnight? Are we going to see a game changer? What needs to happen? Ah, oh, that's a big question. Um, so I think the short answer is you won't see it overnight, I think. But what we will see is a lot of people had these five to ten year plans on how do they fundamentally digitize the entire supply chain. What we should see is kind of the first step being that banks and corporates and carriers can now actually take a lot of their template contracts that are already based on English and Welsh law review that and actually leverage those as the foundation to digitizing these documents without actually making any practical change. For those who do prefer using fintechs to actually digitize the title documents, that's really where the conversation with the fintechs is going to be about how do you amend and adjust the terms and conditions and all of that to leverage the benefits of this law. So I think fundamentally what we'll see is it's going to take probably about six to nine months before we actually start seeing some of the first announcements coming out about people actually leveraging it and more specifically using it in a cross-platform kind of way. We've spent the last three, four years testing the technology and probability side. This will now help solve the legal side. So a good end to 2023. Um, but I think we'll only hit 20, 30 percent probably of global trade digitization um, in the next two years or so. I think it's going to take a while to educate people on how to use it, especially deeper into supply chains. Sure. Now, let's talk about fintechs, which, which, you, which you mentioned, because 2022 wasn't really the year for trade finance fintechs, was it? And, 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 and there's a lot going on kind of with the macroeconomic mm. perspective. You know, what, what's it going to take for fintechs to, like Mineta Go, for example, mm. to, to survive and, and, and prosper given the backdrop of really tough macroeconomic, a, a really tough arena for them and also for 
a real struggle to access funding yeah. from the, the VC markets? So I think I'll, I'll kind of categorize the answer into two buckets. Um, and, and what I'll do is I'll say, in the one bucket, you have a lot of fintechs who produce value where you don't actually require legislative change, yep. where that is not actually a barrier to people adopting and actually getting access to value. In addition to that, you also have in that same bucket a community where banks don't have to necessarily go and change the way in which they totally operate, completely change the trade process to actually get to value. And on the other bucket, you do have fintechs who require the legislative change, and they are trying to reinvent how we do trade finance so that we can actually, you know, start solving this trade finance gap in new and exciting ways. So the answer to that question is kind of different in those two spheres. So I think if we have a look at the first bucket, that's really where Monetigo finds itself in. There's absolutely no legal, you know, things stopping banks from actually leveraging the service. And in addition to that, because there's no legal barrier, it's also something that when you look at it from a portfolio point of view, where banks invest in multiple different use cases for digitization, this is something you can do in the short term and actually get value and actually measure it and see it the way we've done in India and Singapore, et cetera, right? On the second uh, grouping, I think the biggest lesson, and I've spoken to quite a few CEOs in the fintech space, um, and, and what we're seeing is a lot more scrutiny on what is it you're actually delivering and when, right? So firstly, what is the effectiveness um, you know, objectives? Are we actually going to meet it? Am I going to be able to reduce working capital? Am I actually going to be able to extract economic rent through the additional data points that I can get into the supply chain? And so uh, almost a deeper double click on the how realistic is each of those things. Secondly, the efficiency gains. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fintechs are also now being asked questions around, you're saying these are the efficiencies I'm gonna get. Well, give us a little bit of evidence on that. What are the roles that are gonna be reduced? What are the process steps that are gonna be reduced? So I think there's a lot more scrutiny on the practicalities and people have run out of stamina for waiting five years to actually get that benefit reflected on their balance sheet. So a lot of questions about what is the value I'll see in 2023 or at most 2024 so that I can manage expectations internally. I think it's healthy. Yeah. And the reason I think it's healthy is because it forces us to actually focus both groups on the things that matter most and that can actually deliver tangible value. So can you talk about that now in relation to, to Mineta Gay? What, it, what exactly is that value add and can you talk about some of the use cases perhaps with regards to the trade register or the India Singapore projects and put that into action? <laughs> uh, definitely. So uh, so if I if I have a look at Monetigo, we really answer a very simple question for banks. Uh, has someone else actually in the finance community financed this trade transaction? Um, am I the only one or is it actually being duplicated? It yeah. really is that simple. It's something that banks cannot answer on their own. Legally speaking, they can't phone each other up and say, you know, have you actually financed this trade from this customer, right? So, and we've seen what the consequences are. We've, we've seen recently, last year, over $400 million, I mean pounds, sorry, are uh, being lost due to that. And globally, you know, upward of 10 billion um, that we've actually seen in the public domain. So it is a problem that needs to be fixing. Um, and we fundamentally offer the solution. And we've done that in India and in Singapore with millions of transactions. So, so what now, what next, right? So the first thing that I absolutely love about Ashlyn, our CTO, is she's actually built the foundation of the product off the same standards you see in the ICC standards toolkit, which is again one of the reasons I joined them. So that means we can actually go offer the value to banks without asking them to change the way they either execute their processes or introduce new data elements that's specific to Monetigo. So whether it's a bill of lading or an invoice or whatever is actually used to finance it, we, we need a specific set of UNC fact data fields and boom, we can answer it. Yep. So for us, for 2023, it's a very practical year. Um, we're launching a project with the ICC UK shortly and I believe Chris is here somewhere. Um, I think that's going to see a lot of uh, traction, uh, specifically the first country in G7 to actually take the step and actually solve it. Um, and in addition to that, uh, some additional ones which I can't announce, but other associations also saying, you know what, 
this is something we can solve in the short term, let's just do it. Um, so it's yeah. going to be an exciting year, a lot of work, um, but looking forward to it. Yeah, <laughs> and you mentioned 400 million pounds of, of, of losses here in the here in the UK. I mm -hmm. guess that's also in relation to the project you're doing with the International Chamber of Commerce UK. Can you can you talk a bit more about that project? Yeah, so, um, so fundamentally what we're focusing on doing is bringing together the banking community. We've had a lot of requests from bankers saying we need to solve this, but we can't solve it on our own mm -hmm. because we know that if there's a gap in the market, fraudsters will fundamentally leverage that gap. And so ICC is the perfect convener to actually say, well, how do we actually just get around the table and solve this and solve this quickly? In addition to that, Chris is doing an absolutely remarkable job, again, coming back to trade documents um, and working with the fintech and business community, launching a few other initiatives this year um, to ensure that once the bull kind of gets done and settled, we also have the best practices and, and you know, all the capability um, uplifting our products that's required to actually get it to scale. So exciting. Exciting times indeed. Oswald, thank you very much for joining us thank on you. Trade Finance Talks TV here at the BAFT Europe Bank to Bank Forum. Thank you. Thanks.